Your Creative Push, Episode 103. You're always trying to remove the anxiety from your process. You don't want to be anxious while working because then you just get suffocated. Welcome to Your Creative Push, the podcast that pushes you to pursue your creative passions. I'm your host, Youngman Brown, and my guest today is Edward Westerheis. Edward is a multidisciplinary artist based in Vancouver, British Columbia. His work moves between visual art, video, and performance, often collaborating with other artists and working within the community. He creates imaginative worlds that play with an epic sense of scale, forming allegories that reflect the places he lives. Whether he's making sci-fi cardboard puppet shows or music videos with giant dancing cats, Edward uses humor to create the unexpected and to carve out space for new perspectives. Edward has presented his work across Canada from coast to coast, including the Yukon Art Center, the Banff Center, and the National Art Center in Ottawa. Edward, first of all, thank you, man, for coming on the show. And I have to ask, have your ideas always been so imaginative? Can you kind of like take me down the journey that that, that took you to the place that you're at now? Yeah, thanks. Uh, When I first started making movies, um, I was making movies with a big group of friends. Uh, there's about maybe four or five of us kind of in a nice tight group. Uh, we met in school mm-hmm. and we just started making projects with each other. And we would do these really extensive, you know, 24 hour film festivals. And we'd always kind of be pushing each other uh, to kind of create new things. So I think I was always kind of it was a little bit out there, really kind of experimental, really trying to push the envelope. But I think over time, I've been able to kind of recognize my own process and see, you know, how, how do you develop a, an idea from like a kind of a, a glimpse of an image to developing that into a fully thought out project. Yeah, which is <laughs> sometimes that's like one of the hardest things to do as well is to get this idea for like a big project like your your dancing cats video, which is freaking awesome, dude. Um, <laughs> it's so cool. Uh, and I Yeah, thanks so much. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I guess when you get an idea like that, what's, like, the first thing you do when you have this grand idea, but you're kind of nervous about all the different elements that that it will take to make, you know, a three-minute Dancing Cats video, which is, like, has high production quality, and it it requires so much different moving parts. Yeah, the the idea for the cat video came out, like, um, I remember just, like, sketching in my like in my book and it was just kind of like a really throwaway idea mm-hmm. off to the side actually it started out as a doodle i drew this head of a cat with with three eyes and kind <laughs> of like and two tongues and i thought about a double cat as as, as, a, as a word mm-hmm. uh and it kind of stayed with me and then over time it kind of grew in the back of my mind i had drawn it maybe like four years ago and it would never like it would never leave <laughs> Mm-hmm. And then, uh, and then the idea kind of morphed over and over. Like I thought about two cats, uh, giant in scale, kind of like Godzilla or Power Rangers having a dance battle. <laughs> and it was it was like the slow burning idea that was like just creeping over time. And I would do sketches and like try to forget about it and push it out of my mind. Uh, and then I remember one time I was thinking about it and I was just like laughing to myself. And uh, my partner Alicia was like, she asked me. Um, Hey, what are, what are you thinking about? <laughs> and I had not told her anything about this, about this project idea. And so like, oh, um, it's like this video with like giant cats and they're dancing <laughs> over top of the city and they're having a b- battle. And like, <laughs> so you uh, asked. <laughs> and she's like, okay. <laughs> yeah, she's like, okay, that, that's, that, that's awesome. Mm-hmm. Uh, but she was like, you're crazy. <laughs> right, right. But, but. But, but in, the, in the best of ways. Well, I mean, I, I think that, you know, that's really inspiring because a lot of people get, I, my, myself included, you get these ideas that you're like, eh, I don't know. Like, I don't know how I could, you know, incorporate this into the world or I don't know how this would be received. And, you know, you just keep, like you said, you keep trying to push it away almost. And then it, those ideas that linger, like they have to come out. Like, so congratulations to you for, for, for yeah. creating it because it is awesome like i said everybody yeah. check it out uh doublecatvideo.com is that the best place to find it yeah doublecatvideo.com will take you straight to the to the, the page where it's at so i had that kind of like that kernel of an idea and i was trying to draw things out i was also uh i moved back to my hometown of surrey bc and it's kind of like this suburban town outside of um 
Vancouver. And it's like the fastest growing city, I think in Western Canada or something like that. Like there's like 1,200 people coming each month into the city. Hmm. Uh, it's just a crazy amount of growth. And like there's so many changes happening there. The changes that have been happening in the city have been have been kind of like soaking in my mind at the same time. So I don't know, it was it was kind of like this idea that I had with this double cat having a dance battle kind of connected really well with this kind of new climate that's happening in my my hometown. So I wanted to kind of like use the two to kind of discussing, you know, almost like these invisible giant monsters are like creating this, like this actually, there's another force that's kind of invisible that's happening in the city, it seems like. Mm-hmm. So there's, there's, these these cats are kind of like the giant forces that we, we can't see directly, but we see like all these skyscrapers going up and all these changes and new glass towers and transit. And it's wonderful and beautiful, but it's also like somewhat frightening at the same time. Yeah, absolutely. I li- I like that interplay and I can I can definitely see what you mean. The funny thing is it's like you think double cat dancing Power Rangers Godzilla like dance off, <laughs> but uh at the same time you can also, you know, incorporate I- big ideas like that into it as well. So it's mm-hmm. it's pretty mm-hmm. cool. Thanks. Can you talk about your TED Talk cuz that's pretty cool? Yeah, that was like um it was an amazing experience. So we uh I was a speaker at TEDx East Van. I started in video, but then I kind of fell into this world of puppetry uh, when I moved up to Whitehorse in the Yukon Territory in the northern part of Canada. And so my TED Talk is a lot about how in video making, it's all about having that really clear vision. So I have this idea about these cats, and these, this project that I want to make, and I know exactly how I want to move the camera, and I know what the characters are going to look like, and I know the locations are going to be at, and all these things are like that my creative vision for the project, and I have to have a very clear idea about where I'm going. And it's all about executing that that specific vision, uh, but with puppetry, it's more about embracing the unknown, but like not knowing where you're going uh, when you're performing. It's all about uh, it's always a process of discovery of, of finding something new in your performance, even though you might do the same routine each night. Each night has to be different. Uh, the creation process is like you have your script, but then you also have your puppets, um, and when you take the script and you start to play with the puppets. The puppets become uh, kind of a, take on their own life, and so you're always kind of responding to what's happening. Uh, and then so all these kind of things come together, and they change my practice as a as a performer and as a filmmaker. Because in my shows, I perform on stage with a video camera. Uh, it's a, a a small scale puppet show that I film, and the feed from my camera is connected to a big projector, and so there's like a simultaneous puppet show on the stage within a live film on the screen above. So as a filmmaker who's kind of moved between short films, animations, and now on stage with puppets, I learned how to let go of that control. About It's not about executing a very specific vision, but allowing things to kind of adapt and uh, unfold through kind of a very natural and uh, intuitive process. Yeah, and I would imagine that that keeps you on your feet as well and <laughs> makes it <laughs> it makes it yeah. not just the same old thing every, every day. It makes it a, an ex- interesting experience for you as well, not just the audience. Yeah, like um like the the puppet shows we do are sci-fi cardboard puppet shows. Mm-hmm. And so everything's like really small scale puppets uh and they're really intricate and there's a lot of magnets involved and there's uh things on sticks and and fishing line. Uh so it's really simple materials. Um and when we do the routine, we do a lot of things all at the same time. We move very quickly. And so like the puppet show can fall apart at any moment. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> and sometimes like we have like, this giant time tunnel, uh, like this kind of like almost like a corkscrew piece of cardboard that's held together with magnets and it spins on a stick and it creates this like optical illusion, like sucking you into a time travel tunnel. And, uh, we had a show recently where the whole thing kind of fell apart, like all the pieces came off of it. And so I'm on stage and I had to come up with a whole new routine, where, <laughs> like like put the camera somewhere else while like the guy frantically, my friend Brian frantically <laughs> fixes the, the time tunnel. Now, did, did you make all of this stuff in there? Yeah, in the puppet shows, like uh, I write the shows uh, along with my friend Brian. And, um, and then we have a creative team that we build the shows up with. And uh, and he, he does a lot of the producing and then I do a lot of the... And, and a lot of the writing, and I do a lot of the design work, and so I, I do I do all the design, design, do a lot of sketching, and make sure that the aesthetic kind of fits throughout the project, and then yeah, to do all the, the building as well. Is there somewhere that people can see this um, that aren't in your town? Yeah, the, like the best way to kind of like see the project is to um, hop onto my Instagram account, 
or check out um, the theater the company that I work with is called Ramshackle Theater um, and if you google their name Ramshackle Theater um, Yukon you can find the, some of the links there as well excellent and for the record your Instagram account is uh, corrugated cat or no. I'm sorry corrugated cut <laughs> yeah that's correct yeah <laughs> my bad it's too much cats going on there <laughs> <laughs> best part about the internet cats on the brain <laughs> So can you take us back to your first or one of your first creative moments and tell us that story? Yeah, I was thinking about this uh, a bit. Um, and one of the first kind of memories I have is uh, like with creativity specifically, I, I remember being in grade one in the classroom and the teacher had left the room. <laughs> I'm not sure why. Yeah, uh, but then <laughs> that's I, when all the best stories <laughs> start. <laughs> so uh, I, I don't remember how I got into this situation, but I remember uh, standing on a chair in the middle of the classroom and um, taking uh, two markers uh, and rubbing them on my tongue. And one, <laughs> <laughs> one was a blue marker and one was a yellow marker. And like the class was like screaming and laughing. And it was like so much. I, I didn't really know what I was doing, um, but it was just so in, enjoyable. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And it was just like, just the, the chorus of people screaming. It was just so overwhelming. And then uh, the teacher walked back in the classroom and her her face just like completely dropped. <laughs> she was like, like stare, she stared straight at me. And all of a sudden I had like, 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 like this terror strike up inside of me. And so I was trying to like get rid of the evidence. And so I, I uh, took my arm and I wiped my, my tongue on my arm. And all of a sudden my whole arm became like a bright green because <laughs> the two colors are mixed on my tongue and then they were like all of a sudden on my arm. Mm-hmm. And it was just like this, uh, I don't know what it was, but that was just like a, uh, this like, like a first moment I have. I kind of like the story because it brings together like this kind of this uh, unexpected craziness that happens or like, um, or like this kind of energy that's from a whole group. And then like this unexpected moment that happened on my arm and just like so, so full of surprise. Yeah, I love that. And it's just like, then you chase that that feeling of, you know, being able to bring a group of people together, like with the same emotion um, mm-hmm. by, by what you do. Mm-hmm. I love that. Do you have any things that initially held you back from being creative or maybe still do? Yeah, uh, I remember like uh, being in school, it was like almost like it felt like a golden time of like creativity, like everything was just perfect. You, you're, just, you're just like living, striving to make art. Uh, you know, for the small cost of student loans, <laughs> you're kind of locked. Small into- cost. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're, you're locked into this paradise. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and then when I left school, and then all my friends dispersed, I moved back to my hometown in Vancouver, and it was just like I had no no infrastructure. I didn't like have no time because I was trying to get work. Uh, when I did have time, I didn't have any ideas or like stuff that I was working on. Um, you know, the whole environment felt so different from where I was before. So like, it just seemed like everything was not uh, lining up for me. Um, I didn't have any peers, um, you know, people to share my work with. Like I, I, I talk about my work and then people would say, oh, that's cool. Or like they'd be really excited about what I was doing, but they wouldn't be able to kind of engage mm-hmm. at, this, at the same level. They're like, hey, well, if, that's kind of a good, cool idea, but have you thought about this? Or maybe you did it this way or hey, that reminds me of this other idea. You know, mm-hmm. I didn't have people who I could share my work with on that level. And I was like totally, uh, it was, you know, it was a really rough time because I just like totally stuck. I really, I thought I was going to be a filmmaker for a long time. It took me a long time to re- try and get to separate the filmmaking process from that creative process. And it wasn't really about the filmmaking that was really attracting me. It was more the process of making a project and that kind of intensive collaborative sort of process. And then how did you get through that? There's a, there's a lot of things there that yeah. that, that happens a lot of time where like it snowballs either in a positive way or a negative way, like where, you know, everything seems to be working right or everything seems to be working wrong. So how did you get through that? Yeah, I think like at first I thought it was just external kind of forces like, oh, I don't have this or I don't have that or I don't have a laptop or I don't have, you know, Photoshop. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you, know, you, you just feel like you kind of list all the things that you don't have. But what I eventually realized was was figuring out my own creative process. Um, I attended this workshop with the National Film Board once, and it was all about understanding your own creativity. Uh, and there's a really amazing book by um, this choreographer named Twyla Tharp. Her book is called The Creative Habit, Learn It and Use It for Life. Mm-hmm. Uh, and in that book, she like talks about you know how, um, finding a creative moment 
in understanding what led to that moment. So if you feel like super inspired one day, you know, what, what, what were you eating that day? Or what was your thought process leading up to that? Or how were you inspired um, that day or the day prior? And sort of mapping your creativity out and to, to learn about what works for you. And so eventually I kind of, I kept doing projects over and over, kind of always trying to do something new. But at the same time, I was looking at what was working for me, like studying my, my own self as a subject <laughs> in mm-hmm. a way. And mm-hmm. like, and then, and so, and then realize, you know, I really need to like share my work with other people. Or when I work at a desk, I can't have anything on my desk except for what I'm working on that very moment because I get way too distracted or maybe it's shutting off the Wi-Fi or maybe it's throwing your phone somewhere else <laughs> uh, so that you can Airplane can't, mode. Yeah, yeah, so you can't be distracted. Uh, so, you know, those things that work for you. Or like uh, when I get anxious and or uh, I'm not sure where I'm going to go, uh, that, you know, I need to start to move. So I go, for, I go for runs quite often if I'm feeling too overwhelmed or I try to... Like if I'm working on a play or a puppet show, I try to move my body so that it kind of releases that anxiety. And so I'm not worried about, you know, being stuck. Absolutely. Yeah. The distraction is a big one, <laughs> uh, especially for me. I, yeah, I need to turn the Wi-Fi off as well as like lock the door, you know, like, <laughs> and just maybe even set a timer. We've talked about that on the show before too, where mm-hmm. you're just like, all right, I have whatever, however many, however much time, like 45 minutes, all right, I'm just going to get to work and just only open the one application or close all the tabs uh, in your yeah. internet browser if you need the internet to, you know, do research or, or something, but, and just really be goal driven, you know? Yeah. Well, and one thing that I've, I found that's really worked for me is like, I think about, you know, heavy thinking and then maybe just like uh, more explore, exploring. Mm-hmm. So uh, I do a lot of time, I do a lot of work writing, you know, applying for for grants or writing my bio or just thinking, journaling, very, very concentrated on my projects to kind of tease out different ideas or kind of discover what's happening. But then I kind of throw that away. Like the other day, I was really working on the, my cat video so much and I was working on my TED Talk and I was working on all these different projects and I was just thinking way too much. Uh, and so I just got a, a bunch of chopsticks I got I pulled some things out of the recycling bin, and I just gave myself like uh, two hours just to do some hot gluing, some cutting with knives, and just build like a mini structure, uh, and not think about it too much. Just like allow myself to kind of um, explore the space, and that and having those kind of those two roles together that kind of like helps me swing between you know really serious thinking and then just exploring through materials. I find like for me that really works with my process. And allows me to reach new ideas a lot, uh, a lot better. And also, I'm not anxious always about about the final product. I know I, know I listen to a lot of your show. Like, there's a person um, recently talked about tricking your brain mm. that we're just going to go for this walk and we're going to do some drawings or mm-hmm. um, you know, there's different there's different techniques that people are using to kind of like uh, do this work. You you're always trying to remove the anxiety from your process. You don't want to be anxious while working because then you just get suffocated or trapped. Uh, so if you're able to kind of say, Hey, this is just a really small thing. I'm just going to, you know, I'm just going to spend five minutes and write down 10 project ideas mm-hmm. or, right. or I'm just going to spend this afternoon and I'm just going to kind of doodle in my journal, you know, I'm, or I'm just going to, you know, whatever it is, if it's sound or music, it's, you're just allowing yourself to kind of explore without being too worried about the end product. Yeah. Taking the pressure off your brain a little bit. That was a uh, Lee Chen, her episode that you referenced. Oh yeah. Um, and Yeah, that's really effective. And I also find that, you know, especially when you have a lot of things going on, like you said, with your dancing cat video and the TED talk and whatever else you've got going on, I just find that if you just write those things down in a list and just write everything that you have to do down on a list, then it's like, all right, like I can stop thinking about this. Like it's, it's on a list and I'll get to it eventually. And just pick one one thing from the list and then hide the list from yourself so you know that like all right there's no point in me thinking about all the different things that I have to do right now like they're all going to be taken care of and I'm not going to forget about them but just take that one thing off of your list and then and kind of hide the list from yourself as well I found to be really really effective yeah for sure and like that's something that Twyla Tharp talks about quite a bit like all those kind of techniques in mm-hmm. her book it's just like it's just so inspiring I, I usually get like really anxious about, you know, like being an artist is really terrifying because it's not a super straightforward career. You kind of have to make your own way. You have to do all these things. And so the pressure's all on you uh, to kind of create something that's amazing <laughs> that justifies you spending all this time on it. But if we just take it like piecemeal, 
step by step, I find that like you can get there. Absolutely. Do you have a, a worst moment or a hardest time specifically with your creativity or resistance? Yeah, I think like the worst moment is like when I came back to Vancouver, I really felt like I was going to be a filmmaker uh, exclusively. And so I, I go to the film festival and I get like the whole industry pass and I go to these events and I, I, I sit through a movie and I just be feeling anxious the whole time because I don't have any projects. I didn't have anything going on. And then after the movie's done, you're supposed to go into the lobby and schmooze and talk about your projects or network. And I feel like such an imposter. Like I, I had no idea what I was doing. I felt like I should be there, but then I wasn't able to produce any ideas or projects. I just felt so like isolated. And so that was a pretty low point because you, you just feel like you you're you know that you're creative, you know that you have skills, but you just feel like totally floundering in this environment. It's worse too because it's like a social environment. You see all these people who are excellent and rock stars at the conf- at the festival and whatnot, and you're just feeling so outside of that that space. So yeah, that's that's pretty that's pretty a low feeling. Like I would I would say creatively. How did you get out of that? Did you have like an aha moment where you, where you, like what was the first project that you did after that point? When I was uh, I was working in the film industry and I was doing like lighting and grip work for TV shows such as like The Guard and Smallville oh, cool. and, and other shows like that. And then I saw this uh, posting for a position to work uh, as a director's assistant. There's this artist, her name is Sukian Lee, and she has like a, a radio show um, that's just retired, but she's also uh, was in Short Bus and she's done lots of various kind of performances and is in bands. And so she's very much a multidisciplinary artist. And so she invited me to uh, I, I, got, I got the position and she invited me kind of really closely in her process. So usually assistants to the director, they usually pick up dry cleaning or they get coffees. Uh, but I assume I found myself like on set with Sukyin. We were, uh, she would ask me to rehearse her actors before they came to set. Uh, if she had like, a creative problem, she, was, she would ask me about what I thought. Uh, we would kind of work through the shots together. Um, we were like kind of really kind of invested working together really closely on this project. And it was felt like such a, a release, <laughs> like after all that time feeling like I was being stonewalled by, you know, this expectations to be an amazing filmmaker, uh, but feeling so out of the loop to be such and tied into this like creative process and help to work on a feature film, see it from all the way through from the beginning to the end. It was like super inspiring process for me. Very cool. Well, I'm glad you're able to be pulled out of that and in such a such a cool way. Yeah. In in a lot of ways, like her work, because she's always moving between different art forms. She's like, you know, musician, broadcaster, artist, performance artist, photographer. Uh, I kind of saw that as a, a really strong role model for my own work. Uh, mm-hmm. Just allowing, like, give myself permission to kind of move between work like that and always trying to find my own voice through projects. So... For the longest time, I was always trying never to do the same thing twice. Always push myself to kind of experiment and and see how, what my voice sounded like in, in different realms. Very cool, man. On the flip side, do you have like a best or most triumphant creative moment that you could tell us about? Yeah. So after um, I worked with Sukian on her feature film, I moved up to Whitehorse in the Yukon Territory. And I started quickly working with this group of puppeteers in um, with Ramshackle Theater and we made this cardboard sci-fi puppet show. And then we were do some local shows. But uh, pretty quickly, we were invited to present at the National Arts Center in Ottawa. So all like the side project, which I was like dumping all this time into, but had no idea where I was going to go. All of a sudden, we were kind of on the national stage. Uh, and it was for this big event called Northern Scene. So it's artists from all over the Northern Territories of Canada. And we all convened in Ottawa. And we got to present our show there and we got to meet with different presenters and like hang out with different artists. And it was just like this amazing energy. Like I remember in this hotel and in the, in the bottom of the hotel, there was a lobby and then different musicians would be playing. And then you would meet um, maybe someone from uh, Nunavut or from Yellowknife or, you know, all these different places. Hmm. I met some ab- Aboriginal artists from Greenland and they were talking about their work that they do and why they're, why they're in Ottawa looking at different artists it was just like totally like mind blowing in a way like that there would be a space possible where these people could come together and be celebrated. And I was paid to go down there and, and like share this work with other people. It was just like, oh my gosh, like it was almost a, a, a an aha moment for me, like to be able to share the work, to be able to 
uh, you know, to be recognized for my for my work. That was like so so inspiring. Very cool. Yeah. And you find that that you know correlates to what you do now. Yeah, when I'm when I'm making art now, I really think about my audience. I think about uh, kind of creating opportunities that exist outside the artwork artwork itself. Mm-hmm. So when I'm like presenting my puppet show. We go on tour. We might go to a few different cities, but then we also do workshops where we kind of show how we make our puppets. Or um, I do some programming at the Surrey Art Gallery, uh, where we have big kind of art parties in the gallery, and we bring in different performing artists and collaborative kind of visual artists, and they're kind of responding to the work that's in the exhibition. Um, but they're also sharing their own projects, and they're kind of bringing people in in a very interactive sort of way, and so. The art on the wall is great, but then there's this giant experience that surrounds the exhibit. And so I really love the opportunities for um, kind of like the, the face-to-face social interaction that can kind of happen around artwork where, you know, you're building that creativity, you're sharing who you are as an artist, um, you're learning from the ch- each other. Um, you know, your podcast is a perfect example of that where, you know, um, in a virtual way where we're always kind of sharing who we are and learning from each other and like, in the way that never existed before, you know, you 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 met a, you filled a gap. <laughs> that was on the podcast sphere in a certain way. Oh, thanks, man, uh, and that's cool, man. I can definitely appreciate that. You know, being able to collaborate like that and being able to share is one of the most important parts of doing art. It's it's being able to express yourself and then, you know, see how others be, uh, express themselves as well and learn from that. Yeah, Edward, what does art and creativity bring to your life? Yeah, that's a, that's a big question for sure. I, I've been kind of mulling it over in my mind for the past couple of weeks, kind of with my writing and thinking. I think, you know, art and creativity, what it brings is, uh, is, a, is a, it's a form of expression for sure. Like I'm able to kind of say things or explore ideas in a ways that I can't in the kind of a conventional sense, you know, writing or talking, you know, working with my hands, uh, making stuff out of cardboard, making puppets. Uh, creating videos that are really surreal and kind of stretch imagination. It allows it's kind of an access point to kind of talk about a really deeper uh, sense of what you know what I'm feeling, what I'm what's going on. But it's also a way to kind of like connect with others. To kind of it's like a, a deep connection point that you can kind of share from yourself, but also uh, pull out from others. So I'm always really inspired. Uh, one one of the things why I love collaborating so much is because I can kind of see people on a much deeper level to kind of we were able to build a communication that is very specific to an art piece but then is also has reverberations you know beyond that kind of like to, at a human to human level absolutely and that is what it's all about it's that communication and you know being able to as we said before you know use a, a dancing cat video to express how you're feeling about you know your growing town or your growing city it's uh it's pretty amazing do you have a, a favorite book or YouTube clip or anything else that you draw inspiration from and that maybe we could as well? Yeah, like I have a top three list. Uh, the first would be that the book by Twella Tharp, Your Creative mm-hmm. Habit. Learn it and use it for life. Uh, the second would be uh, a book by Rilke. It's called Letters to a Young Poet. Uh, it's a collection of 10 letters that Rilke had wrote um, to a poet who was asking for advice on his poetry. And it's just like chalked full of wisdom. It's like, I don't know if I read each of the letters. I kind of savor them <laughs> over time <laughs> and, and, and go back to them very slowly. It's, it's a, such a small book, but it's it's super dense and full of like wise and inspiring notes. And then the, the last one would probably be Elizabeth Gilbert's TED Talk, Your Elusive Creative Genius. That is such good fuel. I, I go back to the video quite often um, and she talks about Eugene is as, a, as external to you so that you're not, it's not about you being an amazing artist, but it's about kind of loving the process of making art. Absolutely. Yeah. And Elizabeth Gilbert has that book that I just started reading, Big Magic, which is really good too. I oh, yeah? recommend that one as well. Oh. oh yeah. Especially if you like the TED Talk. It's very good. Great. Uh, we'll have all those resources linked in our show notes page at yourcreativepush.com slash double cat because <laughs> it's easier than your last name than yeah, spelling sure, your last name sure. oh yeah for sure uh edward it is time for the final push this is where i ask you to reach through the microphone and grab the shoulder of one of the listeners that you've already inspired today that's thinking you know 
maybe I could do this crazy project that I have been, you know, stewing in my brain for, for so long, or maybe I just need to get back to the work that I've already started um, and give them your best advice and push them to do it. So my advice to you would be, if you are wanting to be creative, if you want to kind of express yourself through your artwork, whether it's words or sound, I don't know, at least I've always felt that it's really hard to get started, that there's like this deep sense of anxiety about, you know, you're never going to be good enough or it, the project's not going to be bad or that you see all these other amazing artists on, online and you just feel super overwhelmed by all that. And you you have, feel like you have nothing, you have no muscle, creative muscle built yet. I, I would encourage you just to, uh, you know, look at yourself, uh, look, find out what works for you. Don't worry about the end goal, but value the process of making art. Make it really simple for you each day. Maybe just do one small thing, um, you know, whether it's, you know, taking... 10 minutes to write down five project ideas or um, just experimenting with your hands for a certain set amount of time and don't make it so big just make it small and make it an opportunity to learn about who you are you know the deeper you can understand who you are as an artist the better you can create work and learn about who it is that you are as an artist or how it is that you like to make art and so just embrace that and and get rid of find ways to shut out the anxiety of being overwhelmed by you know, that, that end goal, um, but just allow yourself to explore and embrace not knowing where you're going and, and discover new things about yourself. I love it. Yeah. It's like shutting out all the outside things so you can really find a way to figure out who you are and, and what you want to put out there in the, into the world. Yeah. Cause who you are leads to what you're going to make. If you try to focus on what you're going to make first, you're never going to, you know, it, it, you're going to be, have a lot more troubles along the way. Edward, man, thank you so much for coming on the show today and for giving us that push. Hey, thanks so much. I really appreciate it. Love the show. Of course, man. Thanks. Uh, and you can find Edward on his website, edward.gallery, which is a pretty cool website. <laughs> yeah. Um, and Or you can, of course, check out doublecatvideo.com. I highly suggest you check it out. Uh, it's really cool, and uh, I really appreciate the, uh, the artistry of it, man. Thanks so much. And of course, on Instagram, that's where I found you, uh, Corrugated Cut. And again, all those resources we talked about, you can find at yourcreativepush.com slash double cat. Yeah, and the, and the TED Talk will also be available on my website. So edward.gallery or edwardwesterheist.com. Very cool. Edward, thanks again, man. Hey, thank you, Youngman. Uh, thank you so much, Edward, for coming on the show. You know, I loved his story. Well, I didn't love it. <laughs> But uh, I could really relate to that story about, you know, being at that film festival and you're supposed to have ideas. You're supposed to be kind of creatively bursting with energy and being able to schmooze with other people and talk about your current projects. But we all go through these cycles where, you know, one thing leads to another and suddenly we're just in this creative drought um, and we can't get out of it. We get our writer's block or lack the inspiration to, to come up with something or to do the work. I think a lot of us can relate to that. But it's really important to not be too hard on yourself in those moments, to know that it's cyclical and that you will come out of it. But it's just a matter of, yeah, still going to these film festivals and still surrounding yourself with creative people and still watching videos about creativity or listening to podcasts about creativity until you can pull yourself out of that funk, until you can find that person like he found in Su Kin Lee. You know, sometimes they feel like this huge lucky break when when something like that can come around when a person can come into your life or an opportunity falls onto your lap but in a way the those opportunities are kind of like raining down all the time um you just have to be looking for them and you know sometimes it doesn't rain for a, for a while but uh droughts don't last forever you just got to continue to put yourself out there and keep trying and not give up don't take year long or multi year long hiatuses and yeah, I just have to remind you once again, you got to check out the Double Cat video. It is awesome. On tomorrow's show, we have Michael C. Shunk. You know, I would definitely say if it's, uh, you know, if you're drawing or photography or whatever, cooking or whatever it is that you always end up thinking about doing, you know, just allocate some time and, and do that every day more and more, you know, on your weekends or whatnot. And you know, it'll just sort of naturally grow and or if it grows to however it grows, like wherever it becomes, you know, enjoy that. That's like your own thing. And there's something to enjoy about being able to have an outlet for your creativity, no matter where it goes. You know, don't worry about how far it's going to go. Just focus on what you're doing presently, you know.
Michael is quite the character, and you can immediately tell that by looking at his art. He has a really unique style that, like I was telling him, it just, my face lights up whenever I look at his Instagram account. I just love his stuff, and I really enjoyed my conversation with him. But that is for you on Wednesday. For today, hopefully you were inspired to go and get your work done. So go and get it done. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much for subscribing. Thank you so much for your support on Patreon. Head to yourcreativepush.com slash Patreon or patreon.com slash yourcreativepush, however you like to do it. (laughs) We've got some pretty cool ways that I'm trying to give back to you for what you give to me in the form of not only your monetary support, however big or small, but your reaching out to me and pushing me in that way. So thank you at least for, for checking that out and for helping to push this show forward. Have a great day. Go get your work done. Be productive. And we will be here for you on Wednesday if you need the push again. Have a great day, everybody. Bye.